you know, I feel like we have a we have a critical mass. We can we can get going. So welcome everyone to this Placer AI webinar. Really excited uh, to get to kick off our first webinar of 2022. So a new year. Hopefully, some things will be different this year. <laughs> but but we're looking forward to to lots of of, of webinars together again. Uh, to give you a quick sense of what we're going to do today, we're going to start with a very brief introduction to Placer for those of you who aren't familiar. We're going to dive into the lessons that we've learned from the holidays so now that all the data is in from the holiday season. We're going to look at 2022 expectations, and then as always, we will leave time for questions. If you look at the top or bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Just plug in your questions. We'll try to get to them either in the course of the conversation or at the end, but please feel free to shoot as many of those over as you'd like. And, uh, and now to like uh, the, the best part, right? To introduce our guests. And if we're gonna kick off the year, we have to do it with a bang. And I, I could not be more excited for our guests today. So first, Carly Iacono, the Senior Vice President of CDRE, a leader in the net lease market and the host of the CRE Fast Five. Carly, thank you so much for being here. Ethan, thanks for having me. I'm excited, great to join. Me too. And I, I, I'm a big fan of Carly's content. So I have popped that into the chat. If anyone is interested in, in checking out Fast Five, and her YouTube channel, please make sure to do that. It is uh, very interesting and very informative content. I'm a big fan. And uh, also Jeff Kreshek, Senior Vice President, West Coast Leasing at Federal Realty Investment Trust. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Ethan. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited. This one, we were already getting, we were getting uh, uh, hot and into it already before we got started. So, so get excited because it's going to be a good one. But a quick, super quick introduction to Placer. Uh, what is the data you're going to be seeing today? So we observe a panel of over 30 million devices throughout the United States. Very critically, this is all anonymized aggregate data. So we are GDPR and CCPA compliant. We then analyze that data with machine learning and AI algorithms to make estimations on the visit trends to any retail location anywhere in the country. And we present that data in a wealth of different reports in our platform on everything from true trade areas, void analysis, the customer journey, traffic routes, and much, much more. If anyone is interested in checking it out and hasn't seen or played with the platform before, you can go to placer.ai and sign up for the free version of our premium product or check out our free tools in a section on our website called the square at placer.ai dash the square. And now into the, uh, the content itself, and starting with the holiday lessons. And Carly, I want to start with you here, but we're gonna we're gonna give you the same question, both of you. Carly, what is the biggest takeaway for you from the retail recovery in 2021? I think the most noteworthy thing is the absolute necessity of the physical store. Everything that we've been talking about rolls back to physical retail. <clears throat> Excuse me, whether that be ship from store, smaller prototypes, computer vision, experiential retail all the buzzwords and all the conversations we've been having in 2021, and now at the start of 22, all have a physical component. I have not heard of a single example. Now you might have them because you're very data-driven. So if you do throw it out, but I don't know of any retailers who have said, I'm shutting down all of my stores, I'm going digital only, and then had a banner year. There's retailers who've tried it, but have we seen data where it's like, oh my God, that was brilliant. They crushed it because they closed all their stores. I don't think so. So everything is physical store related. And I think that bodes very, very well for our industry and for retail in general. That's uh, so a really great point. And I'll call out, I sadly don't have the link with me, but if, you, if anyone wants to Google it, some research from a, a, one of our regular guests, Simeon Siegel from BMO on how closing stores very often stops revenue growth. It's not the key to unlocking it. So it's just a, another kind of reiteration of exactly that point. But Jeff, I'll go to you with the same question for you. What was what was the biggest kind of takeaway from what you saw in the recovery? Well, I, I, I would kind of echo what Carly said is you know, stores are, are critical. Um, the retail online experience really left a lot of customers flat. Um, you get, you order something, the thrill of the purchase is gone. It comes a couple of days later in a box. It sits on your floor for three days. It just really wasn't as exciting as people thought it would be. It's a nice supplement, but the physical environment is really, really important. And what you saw uh, with the pandemic is kind of a thinning of the herd. Um, nobody closed all their stores unless they went bankrupt or had to, but nobody closed all their stores, but they use it as an opportunity to say, well, where are our customers how have they behaved? How do we think they're going to behave? And how do we right size, whether it's the store size, the store fleet, locations, how do we put ourselves in the right positions? So your question is, did brick and mortar win in 2021? I would tell you brick and mortar 
really never never lost. Yes, it was losing some margin to uh, to online, but the physical store was even still important. We were talking about this in 19, and it was Amazon's going to kill all retail forever. I never bought into that. And Carly, I, I, we were talking about it before. I don't think you did either. Physical retail is important, but it required everybody to take pause and up their game. And I think it's actually one of the healthier things for the industry right now. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think even, even to Carly's point, what we haven't seen that company who closed everything, went online only and had this banner year, but we have seen companies who stopped being online only come offline and have had banner years. And I think right. it's, it's this, that's the, it's that deeper understanding of what this, the store brings. that's so critical. But I think when we think about like the holiday takeaways, I mean, there, there was a lot of, of, there was a lot of things that made this season unique, but there was a lot of really interesting uh, lessons learned, I think. And, you know, Jeff, when you consider the, the wider context that the holiday season included and that had supply chain concerns, uh, labor shortages, rising COVID cases, how did you think retail performed within that context, specifically brick and mortar? You know, it, it's interesting. I would, I would actually tell you surprisingly well. Uh, we found our retailers to be far more resilient uh, than, than we expected, at least early in the pandemic. Obviously, we've never dealt with a pandemic, so we had no idea what to expect. Uh, and I remember having conversations early in the pandemic about how do we think retailers are going to perform in closed stores or not or survive. And we just really had no idea. And we were predicting just some nightmare scenarios, nowhere near as bad as, as we thought it could possibly get. Um, the retailers were very resilient. They pivoted very quickly, um, some quicker than others. Uh, you know, and uh, honestly, we're, we're pretty impressed with the performance so far, restaurants especially. That's probably uh, one of the, the real highlights is restaurants pivoted quickly. And in some cases, we had restaurants doing more volume during the pandemic than they'd ever done. Uh, it's just crazy, crazy numbers. Yeah, that's, a, that's one that comes up when we talk to a lot of shopping center owners, how impressed they've been with the restaurant sector it has been a recurring theme in, the, in recent months of yeah. that's not where they expected strength no. and they were seeing a lot of it. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting point. But Carly, going to you, I think the, there's a really interesting kind of question right now of what was unique and what is kind of a trend? And so when we think about, you know, declines on Black Friday or, or Super Saturday, you know, the extended holiday season, how much of this, and, and forgive me for using this terminology, but how much of this is the new normal and how much of this <laughs> is, is kind of just a unique occurrence within 2021? I'll try to work new normal to every question just so we get it in <laughs> enough in this webinar to be like on trend. No, just kidding. Um, I thought it was fascinating that retailers can still control consumer behavior. That was my takeaway. And let me tell you what I mean by that. We didn't have the discounts we had in previous years. Why do people shop on Black Friday? The discounts, right? Saving money. You're getting your TV for $200 and it should be $3,000 or whatever crazy numbers you're looking at, right? It's extreme. You know what I mean? So we didn't see those discounts. We didn't see the hype of something only being available for one day. Instead, the messaging was scarcity. So retailers, because of their own limitations with supply chain, flipped the script and they said, okay, consumer, we know you want this. You better buy it in November and you better pay full price. It's just the only way you're going to get it. And we as consumers went, oh my God, we do need that. We don't want to be left out. This is holiday cheer. This is our one chance to make up for all of the misery of the last year. We're going to buy, buy, buy. And we better do it early. We better do it prolonged. We better go to the store and make sure we're not missing anything and be out in full force. So I think despite the headwinds of inflation and higher prices, concerns about COVID, limited supply, all these things that should have kept consumers on the sideline, it was the opposite. And I really think retail in general did an amazing job with the messaging of you're gonna miss out, shop long, shop full price, shop often, and consumers obliged. I thought it was fascinating. I, go ahead, Jeff. Ethan, I was, I was going to say, one of the other really interesting issues uh, about Black Friday, and I mean, this obviously compares Black Friday, but we've, we've kind of been beating the table for a while that Black Friday is irrelevant. Um, it's a great concept. It was, you know, I grew up on going to Black Friday, uh, and it was like a big event. But first of all, I think the consumer has been burnt out. I know that when it came to Black Friday, I, we were out of town for Thanksgiving at my sister-in-law's, and 
my wife says, Ed, you want to go to a store? And we were all like, no, nah. like we're just, we're exhausted. We're worn out. No, but what it really emphasizes is Black Friday can't be the day you're at your peak. You need to, you need Tuesday to be important. You need your anniversary to be important. These environments cannot rely on, okay, we're going to be a mediocre experience for 364 days. And then when we get to Black Friday, we're going to offer, like Carly said, some crazy discount everybody will line up. So I, I would almost argue that coming out of the pandemic, Black Friday as the kind of benchmark as, as to performance or traffic really can no longer be the benchmark. It might be for sales on a day, but it can't be the benchmark. And what I think is interesting about this particular slide is, I, I think if you look at the compared to 2019, so the yellowish bars, I think the argument is going to be that outdoor is going to is going to rule the day going forward in in a lot of places. It certainly won't work maybe in Buffalo, but uh, in California, where I am, outdoor is is certainly taking precedence over indoor. I think you make both of you make two two excellent points. We have a it's funny we have our piece coming out on Monday of our holiday takeaways. And those are, those are two of our big ones. One is this kind of slow decline of Black Friday. Like, don't expect it to be as bad as this year, but it's, it's not going to be amazing in moving right. forward. But Carly, your point is, is, is my favorite of all of retail of the entire year of they incentivized people to do something that was in the best interest of, of the retailer. And they were able to position it so that the shopper was like, yeah, all right, this makes sense. I'm in. That is... <laughs> a game changing thing when you you think about what happened so long we're like the customer is always right you have to serve the customer mm -hmm. and you do obviously but these retailers were able to successfully have this conversation of guys if we want this to happen we got to change our behaviors and people bought in i i, I mm -hmm. it is it's it's my favorite retail thing of, of 21 but uh all Great. right holiday surprises so carly start with you here what surprise or impressed you most from the holiday season I think, again, it, it just goes back to the positivity of the consumer. We had a lot to no stimulus compared to the year prior. We have a ton of people resigning from their jobs, a lot of fluidity in that market, as we all know, at nauseum. We just have a lot of instability in America, but yet the American consumer is incredibly bullish and out shopping, positive and, and ready to go. So I think the overall sentiment was something that was even better than I expected, despite the headwinds that, that could have really taken down the numbers. That's a very good point. Jess, same question for you. What, what surprise or impressed you most from the holiday season? It, it, largely the same thing. I mean, the, the, even with, with uh, flaring up of Omicron and, and inflation and all the things that, that Carly mentioned, the consumer still showed up. Um, they showed up, they obviously, to, to the previous slide, uh, the, the retailer has somewhat changed their thinking and their mentality and their behavior, but they showed up in droves. They were positive. They were spending. Uh, it was a, a, across a broad, broad category, but they wanted to be out. Um, I, everybody was saying they weren't sure what was going to happen with the holidays and whether people were actually going to come out or sort of hunker down. And they went to physical retail in droves. It was really, really impressive. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very important points, but now going into this from kind of the retail segment perspective. So whether it's fitness or grocery or, or luxury, I mean, sectors that really kind of caught our eyes. And Jeff, I'll start with you. Which retail segment impressed you most in 2021 and why? Uh, well, restaurants, uh, because of their resilience. I did a panel, I want to say it was April of 2020, and uh, they were talking about 50% of all restaurants were going away and uh, obviously nowhere near that number. But what was really shocking is how they pivoted, how the consumer basically got comfortable interacting with them uh, and how their sales performance was. It was off the charts in some cases. Uh, and I think for retailers, I think what was really interesting is you saw some, some really, really good brands that had, had an opportunity to grow pre-pandemic that were just trying to find their space and all of a sudden were able to, to pop up in a big way and really perform. Viore is probably one of the, the bigger success stories. You know, there were a few stores before the pandemic, used the pandemic to really grow uh, up their advertising. Uh, I'm actually wearing real pants today, not stretchy pants. So, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't hate me for that. But, you know, the consumer basically went out and engaged with a new brand on, on such a big, big level. 
Um, and I, I will tell you one of the bigger things that really won in this is outdoor environment, streets, downtown neighborhoods, walkability, uh, not having to get in your car and fight a big, big project, but rather having some sort of human scale to the retail. I think that's going to be the real winner coming out of this is neighborhood retail. That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting point. And it's one where, you know, again, I think it's, the data really backs it up in terms of where we've seen these migration shifts, how movement patterns have changed and who might be well-oriented to, to, to take advantage of those shifts. Right. Carly, same question for you, which retail segment impressed you most in 2021 and why? There's a few ways you could answer that. I think to highlight your graph, grocery is impressive that it's still holding on as strong as it is, especially because restaurants are doing well. We're just apparently eating more as a country. Um, but I mean, that they're both really outperforming. That's, that's pretty fascinating. Um, and we haven't seen people go back to the, the order out. Everyone still seems to be really focused on the grocery category. So that's an interesting space to watch. And then you have brands that just were really well positioned to kind of the climate and the market dynamics before the pandemic. And they just kept adapting like wildfire, like convenient and discount treasure hunt still doing well. When people go out, they want that experience. They're going to go to TJ Maxx. They're going to go to all those retailers that were already doing really well before. So I think those aren't so much a surprise, just a continued uh, sort of impressed nature that, wow, these categories were so good before, but yet they're still evolving and they're, they're staying relevant and they're getting even better. Restaurants, yeah. to, to echo Jeff, were probably the biggest, uh, not surprised, but impressed that they did pivot and come back so quickly, which is great. I mean, those are, they're great examples. For me, it's fitness. Mm. If you think of the conversation we were having last year, it was, well, Peloton's here, so goodbye every gym that ever existed, as if there was never any pull to that. And yet, the moment we can go back to the gyms, gyms are seeing visits on a really strong pace heading into January. These, you know, Peloton's last earnings kind of, you know, reinforce what we probably should have remembered, which is there isn't a basement in suburban America that doesn't have a treadmill on it that's like kind of filled with clothes and it's a mix. It's at home is at home fitness is really important and it's an important segment, but it doesn't negate, you know, going out, you know, uh, for those of you who are at ICSC, we were talking to some folks in from the fitness sector when we were there and they were like, yeah, we have customers, a lot of customers were doing both. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, people finding their mix. That, that was the sector that. Well, but, but Ethan, to that know. point, I mean, I, I think when the pandemic hit, everybody went to extremes. Online is going to kill physical retail. Uh, Peloton is going to kill all, all gyms, uh, you know, home delivery, you'll never go to the market again. And you had all of these, these, this huge pendulum swing and all of these extremes. And then it, it sort of normalized as, you know what, the behavior we had before the pandemic, that's coming back. I, I think you make I, a really good, go ahead. I think really everyone does not want to do everything from home. That's what no. it boils down to, right? We don't want to cook at home, work from home, exercise at home, take care of our kids at home. Do I mean, we're not a creature or a society that wants to be isolated at home. So as right. we can, pieces of that are going to go back out into the world and create some sort of hybrid where both are relevant at home uh, and that's, outside. We're, we're, we're not simple single entities where oh, if we can do everything at home conveniently, we're never leaving our house again. We want a mix. And I think that's it's, mm -hmm. it's exactly what you're both saying. Question came in from Maria. Uh, do you know how much are the customers are spending now in comparison to 2019? Is Are we essentially seeing less visit frequency, but more transaction sizes? Uh, the answer is it very much depends. It's something we've we've dug into a lot on our research side, trying to understand spending patterns. It does shift by sector and by period of time throughout the years. So for example, uh, party sizes were larger in the summer than they had been in the past. No camps, no international travel. There's reasons for that. Basket sizes in some sectors were much higher and some sectors were, it was less uh, a magnitude of difference. So it does really depend, but there, there have certainly been shifts in the balance between how much time we're, you know, the, what we're spending per visit and the level of intent that's coming with each visit. You know, luxury is a great example of that where the people are coming with a much greater intent to buy and they're buying much more than they had in the past. So even in points where there was lower visits, it was still seeing really large numbers from a, from a transaction, from a volume perspective. I want to shift focus now. So we talked about segments and now I want to dig into the retailers themselves. And you know, Carly, you mentioned some of these earlier, but which, you know, give me a retailer or, or you know, a few retailers that really impressed you most in 2021 and, and why? Start. 
Yep. So I have two that I think are amazing and I touched on them a moment ago by category and they are Dollar General and 7-Eleven. Now, Dollar General, number one, their continued expansion, 750 to 1,200 new locations every single year for the last five years, probably even longer than that. It's just, it's hard to even comprehend how they can continue that pace. Pandemic, no pandemic, doesn't seem to matter. And on top of that, just becoming America's brand everywhere, they're rolling out Pop Shelf, which I think is so smart. And it's this completely new concept to draw in consumers that aren't connected with the brand. So I love their adaptation, their creativity. And when they think they've saturated a market, oh, they're gonna start a new concept that's just close enough that it's in line with their brand, but far enough that someone who wouldn't necessarily shop at Dollar General on a regular basis goes, oh, this is really exciting. Can't wait for this to come to my neighborhood. And I think they're, they're just doing an exceptional job of, uh, of both parts of their strategy. Uh, 7-Eleven, very similar growth pattern, absolutely on fire. I thought the Speedway acquisition was brilliant, but they have organic growth as well. So they're opening new prototypes. They have a very heavy focus on technology, which I think is extremely impressive. Their 7Now delivery app is, is great. It really is. It's very fast delivery from their thousands and thousands of stores all over the country and they're expanding the product offering. They're using AI and touchless technology and all these things that they're beta testing in different areas. So they already have an established brand, but they're not becoming boring retail, which as we were saying before the webinar started is what was killing retail before the pandemic, just being boring. So they're not doing that. They're taking convenience, which is really kind of a boring category as it is, right? You go in, you buy your whatever, your gum, your Slurpee, I don't know. Like that's not very exciting, but they've made it interesting. They were re-engaging the consumer and then they're hitting on convenience, experience, technology, all of it rolled into one. I mean, I, I feel like I have to say shame on you for saying Slurpees are, are boring. As yeah, if. like I, I was about to jump <laughs> all over that. I, I, high school Ethan is very offended. One. That's pretty cool, <laughs> apparently. I, haven't tried I, I wonder if Slurpee <laughs> is literally the leading category for 7-Eleven that draws more people into the store than just could about be. anything else. It could be. <laughs> I only go for ice. That's my big draw. I'm like, oh, I need ice, 7-Eleven. Where else am I going to go? Oh, sorry. That's my big one. Uh, Jeff, same question for you. The retailer that impressed you most in 2021 and why? Um, honestly, mine would be Nike. Uh, so it's a really interesting dynamic. So Nike has, has done so much with wholesaling and certainly don't want to speak for Nike. But first of all, you have this confluence of two things. First of all, it's Nike wanting to control their brand messaging at a higher level. Because think about it. You go into your average sporting goods store or uh, mall and shoe store. It's just a wall of shoes and somebody there to, to help you, hopefully, that knows what they're talking about. But Nike wanted to control that relationship and that messaging. And also, I do think one thing that the pandemic has completely obliterated is the idea that uh, you need to dress up to go to work. Uh, I'm not sure I'll ever wear a suit again. I'm, I think I've, I've atrophied and no longer know how to tie a tie. But, um, you know, the bridge between casual and workwear, so Nike came out with things like their, their blazer shoes, right? And you see those all over the place in Silicon Valley is like the, sh the shoe you wear to work. And so Nike's been able to not only morph into workwear as opposed to just workout wear, but they've also controlled their brand messaging specifically with Nike Live at a higher level, higher price point, higher touch than, than your average shoe store or your average sporting goods store. So now, if I want cleats, I might go to, to Dick's to get them. But if I want to buy something that I'm going to wear out to dinner with a pair of jeans and a, and a sport coat, I'm going to Nike Live. And I have that relationship directly with Nike, not through a third-party wholesaler. So we're seeing more and more brands start to take their brands, for lack of a better term, take their brand messaging back. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see how more brands do that. Such a good point. I think one of the things we we lose we that often gets missed in the digitally native brand conversation is the the Nikes, the Lululemons, the Pumas, the Adidases, who are Levi's, who are looking yeah. more to that owned retail experience as their wholesale or their wholesale kind of perspective shifts. And it's exactly what you're saying. It's I the experience matters. It's part of the user acquisition. It's part of you know there was a there's a statistic that we love to talk about, but 
I worked in, in kind of uh, a previous uh, role in doing that for a digital intelligence company. And one of the things that we found was that less than 10% of Nike visitors will also visit lululemon.com. So online, that cross shopping is unbelievably limited across visits. And it means that the discovery happens somewhere else. And Nike and Puma and Lulu realize that it's happening in their stores, it's happening in their advertising campaigns. A lot of the things that we kind of, you know, we look down on because they're considered kind of old or traditional are actually still incredibly important, especially as the cost of user acquisition online continues to grow and the competition there continues to increase. Well, add to that, that, you know, if you're Nike and you want somebody to have a physical experience, are you controlling that messaging or is it Foot Locker or Shoe Palace or Dick's or something, somebody else? And when I walk away from a store with a bad experience on a, a Nike shoe, am I having a bad experience with Nike or bad experience with the wholesaler or both? And so what ramifications does that have and how can Nike how can Nike have a, a little closer relationship directly with the consumer? It's not a one, you know, one size fits all. They're never going to, well, I don't want to say never, I don't know what their plans are, but you can't see them necessarily ducking out of all wholesale, but it's having that, uh, that multi-channel I have online, I have wholesale, I have discount or outlet, but I also have this kind of special brand that, that deals directly with the consumer on a more, more impactful basis. Yeah, it's, and it's also less, I, I, I know this is a sillier example, but it's important, I think, for the same reason. m and m store. Look at how many people walk through M&M stores, whether it's in Times Square or Orlando. Is, is m and just selling all the m ms they need through that store? Of course not. But you walk into that store, especially as a kid, it's, it's a different type of experience. The NBA right. store in New York City, like it's, these are, these are, ex, it's experiential retail that still can, you can still sell, but it's about understanding that you're going to carry that in, in interaction, that experience with you for a very long time if it's positive. I I, compl- I, I love that point. I think it's really really important. Um, you know, we talked, we we did, we touched on this a, a bunch. So I want you to give me if you give if you give me one already, you can't use the same one twice. But you have to give me the biggest surprise of 2021. Jeff, I'll start with you. I was hoping you were going to start with Carly. On that. No, no. <laughs> uh, you can you can I, I think that, I think that the biggest surprise. Um, is sort of yet to come, which is you have AMC up here. It's what's going to happen with the movie theaters. Um, They got hit as I think everybody expected. They closed down and they got hit really, really hard. But it's the rise. Is this one of those items, unlike say home fitness, where everybody wanted to go back to the gyms or a lot of people have gone back to gyms. Are people going to go back to the movie theaters in the same way? Um, or is that one of those industries that's just been permanently damaged and there really isn't this equilibrium between streaming at home and going out to the movie theaters where, you know, again, I think there's fitness, it's a little bit more, they'll go back a little quicker and go back to their previous habits. I'm not sure that's going to happen with the movie theaters. And that's, to me, I, I think the, the surprise is yet to come as to whether the movie theaters can truly rebound or not. Uh, that's a good one. Carly, same question. So. It's not a surprise if it already happened. We've already talked about it. So I think the surprises are in 22. But one thing I guess I was somewhat surprised we didn't see more of was MedTail, medical and retail combined. You know, we had a flurry of new urgent cares opening pre-pandemic. And then everybody was talking about medical and how that was an important space moving forward and how consumers couldn't get their COVID tests when they wanted them or they couldn't get to the doctor. So I think that's going to kind of roll over into 22, our experience with medical and retail. And we're going to see more of Aspen Dental's one that's been very successful, right? That retail medical confluence as consumers continue to express frustration with getting the services they need, COVID or no COVID. So I think the fact that we didn't see more open in retail centers last year was kind of a surprise to me. Um, but I think the concepts haven't been all fully baked and they're not quite sure how to roll it out on a, a grander scale. A lot of MedTail is still backed by small groups of doctors or regional operators. It's hard to nationalize it. But I think moving forward, that might be something we see more of that would be interesting to watch. It's interesting. I, I mean, Jeff, I really loved your point. One of the comments, do you remember June last year, the whole conversation was around who's going to buy AMC? Was it Amazon? Yep. Is it going to be Disney? Is it going to be Netflix? I just remember thinking like that we were having, we had a webinar like this and it was one of the questions. It's someone's got to buy who realizes it can't just be movies. It's got to be 
something it's got to be things that there's a there's urgency and there's a desire to watch in a crowd i, right. I don't want to watch a movie that's going to make me sad in a movie theater i do want to watch spider-man in a movie theater i might even right. want to watch football games in a movie theater but it's how do you tap into the content distribution as opposed to being limited to to uh suggest you know hey we're a place to come see a movie yeah well listen it, it goes to um you know what's what's coming in 22 I, I think if I had one buzzword for 22 and it applies to the movie industry is specifically is evolution. They're going to have to evolve how they behave. The, the, the one thing I think the pandemic has done is it's sort of shaken everybody up of the status quo from 2019 just isn't going to cut it. Um, what are you doing that's different? How are you, uh, how are you evolving your business? How are you interacting with your customer different? And in the movie industry, exactly. How are they going to use, utilize those screens more than just, Thursday night, there's a great movie. I need to go see it on the big screen. That, that's just not going to, in my opinion, that's just not going to work going forward as, as the sole source of, of, uh, of visits. What about an e-gaming partnership? Yeah. Is anyone We're starting to hear about, about that? This. We're hearing right? about it. An AMC e-gaming. Yeah. I'm sure they could be retrofitted to use the screens and create a more immersive experience for the audience. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think yeah, they're starting, they're starting to do that. It, it's re I mean, I think it's, it's this under, you know, we saw it with malls and you, you, you've both been talking about it, how, you know, people are thinking differently about their shopping centers, what belongs in them, what doesn't belong in them, but it, it applies to any space. I mean, all we're saying about a movie theater is it's a big screen and stadium seating. It, that's the only, as long as it fits within those parameters in theory, you can go any direction with it, which is pretty, pretty exciting. I mean, Jeff, I'll give you the opportunity to say that your trend as the most important trend to track was evolution, or you can throw in a different one. But I'll start with Carly here. Carly, what's the biggest trend to be looking at in 2022? I think technology and computer vision specifically, because the implications have a far reaching effect. So we're just starting to understand what we as in people not deep in uh, AI every day, we're just starting to understand the applications for the consumer experience but also for labor stability, right? If we have cashierless, contactless checkout, or we have better technology for the, the back end of the store, that has labor implications that could really help retailers kind of overcome what's a very big challenge right now. So the application of AI and all the different ways it's going to affect retail is I think something we need to watch who's gonna adopt it fastest, Who's going to beta test things that fail and then pivot quickly? And then how does all of that relate back to the smaller retailers that maybe don't have those capabilities? Are they going to be able to keep up? Uh, very good point. Jeff, you can, you can do a different trend or you can kind of double down on the evolution, whatever you think. Well, I, I think the, besides evolution, it's going to be a flight to quality, um, both for the consumer and for the retailer. Um, you're going to see aggregation into the better projects so that the really great environments should continue to evolve their, their merchandising, should be able to attract customers and continue sales growth um, if they're diligent about what they do. Whereas, you know, B properties, C properties, I think ultimately have to start looking to the future of what can we be next because what we've been isn't going to work any longer. So I think there's going to be a big, big flight to quality. And, and going back to evolution, though, that stands for everybody. Um, the customer is always evolving. The retailer needs to evolve how they interact with them, whether it's technology or product mix or store design. And quite frankly, the landlords have to evolve as well. Um, the notion of I signed a 20 year lease. So when I got into the, to this business back in the in the 80s, you signed a 20 year lease or 10 year lease with two five year options. You said, I'll see you in 20 years. Um, now we look at it. If we if we sign a 20 year lease, which we really don't. Uh, we're saying, okay, we'll, we'll evaluate this along the way. And if it isn't working at any point in time, we're going to be more aggressive about replacing it as opposed to saying, yeah, well, I've got a lease that goes for 10 more years, so I don't have to do anything. It's not a matter of what can you do, it's what should you be doing. That's a very good point. Uh, I actually, I mean, I'll, one of these, so the top right is, is touching on our kind of the digitally native brands, even the Nikes of the world, kind of their, the importance of what they mean. But I want to touch on Jeff's point earlier, the, the right sizing. And I think right sizing, not just in terms of closing stores, figuring out where, but figuring out the right size for your actual location. What's the format we should be using in different places? I think that Bloomies concept is it's absolutely fascinating what happens there. There's going to be big ramifications in some, in some spaces. 
That's a great one. Um, Jeff, I'll start with you here. Give me one retailer you think will dominate in 2022 and why. And the perils of working from home. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping that somebody's going to... Uh, we, we win today because none of my children. Carly, Carly gets to go first. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first on this one. Stay by the phone call. Uh, it's kind of an obvious answer, but I've been really impressed with Target, and I think they're going to continue to crush it in 22. I love their brand partnership. They have found a way to make affordable apparel, apparel hot and trend worthy and uh, create the scarcity again that we talked about earlier. So I love what they're doing with their influencers and their brand partnership. I think their Ulta Beauty concept and partnership will drive a lot of traffic to them as the beauty segment is increasingly on fire. And then they, they still have their core base for affordable everyday products that people are gonna continue to need. Plus they have a fantastic delivery system. They have a very dependable in-store experience. It's not exciting, but it's, it's good, it's fine. You go in, you get what you need, you find some new things along the way, end up with twice of what you thought you needed and you leave, which is great for them. So I think they've got a lot of things figured out. I mean, I agree. It, it's so boring to say target at this, but they're so know, good. Sorry. How do you not? <laughs> no, I, we did We did our piece. We pick our winners of the year every year. And the first one we picked this year was target. And we said, we know it's boring. We're sorry, but you can't, it's denying. You'd be, you're just yep. denying reality by not saying, having them on the top of your list. Just they, they seem to do so many things so well. And we could probably say Amazon too, if we're just going to be like <laughs> Captain Obvious. Yeah, but right? I was going to go, I was going to go with Target. I was going to go with Target as well. So since, oh, uh, yes. since, glad I got it in first. And, and, and I love Target, <laughs> but since, since, uh, since Carly did Target, I'll do Amazon. I, I do think that what's really interesting is their ability to pivot lightning, lightning quick. And I guess it's the old saying fail fast. Um, you know, how they integrate technology and change concepts and are constantly evolving. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this uh, department store that's rumored to be coming out at some point and how that goes. But you look at Four Star and their ability to change merchandise and they have books and they have grocery and they have Go. Um, you know, Amazon cl clearly is going to be one of those groups that is going to push every envelope that they can and and every boundary they can. And so if there's going to be some new discovery, I, I'd bet a lot of money that they're going to be the ones who figure it out quickest. Target though, I, I love Target as a store. It's just, it's, you look at what happened with Target and Kmart as, as kind of case studies. They both had kind of similar real estate, similar concepts, similar everything. And Target just, you know, took it to the stratosphere and Kmart obviously just completely went away. Um, there was no reason for it. They, any of those brands could have figured it out, but Target really got the combination right. And I got to give them a lot of credit. I'll, I'll, I'll quote a friend, Robin Lewis from the Robin Report, talked about Target. And he said, when everyone, he said, that if you want to understand why that brand has done so well, it was when they were doing their worst and their CEO came in and said, hey, we're now going to go make this, our situation, take it from bad to even worse because we're going to spend tons of money on redoing everything and changing the way we operate. It wasn't popular, but it was the right decision. And even Q3, they got hit. Their stock got hit because, because they kind of didn't hit. They didn't have the revenue targets they wanted because they swallowed the added cost that would have gone to the customers to keep that customer understanding that, hey, we're going to be there for you in the long term. And I, I think we, we lose sight on these brands that really have a clear long-term focus and are not just playing the short game. I, I you know, well, Ethan, one of my favorites. Ethan, to that point, I mean, remember the experience with uh, J.C. Penny a, a number of years ago with Ron Johnson. You know, he came in and basically, you could make the argument was was stealing a page from Target's playbook of let's go into brand partnerships, let's get off of this discounting, let's let's really change and. It, you had to know it was going to upset a lot of consumers, but they quickly pivoted back and said, well, we've upset a lot of people. Let's go backwards. At least from, obviously I have no inside knowledge, at least from the outward appearance, that's what it was, but it's not easy to do. And it takes a long vision and a lot of guts. Uh, agreed. And speaking of guts, and then we're going to get into the questions. Carly, I'll start with you. You One bold prediction for 2022. This is going to be the year of proactive retail instead of reactive retail. I think we're going to finally see people thinking, what do I want? Like you just said, the next five to 10 years to look like instead of, oh my gosh, we're not doing well. Now, what do we do? So that's a big shift. I also think we'll see a lot of creativity. We're going to have a huge uptick in small business. 
this great corporate resignation is going to lead to a lot of new entrepreneurs, which hopefully will do well, fingers crossed. Uh, so we're going to see new concepts that are going to come. There'll be a lot of turnover, but a lot of exciting new things happening in retail as existing retailers become proactive and small business upticks. Great one. Jeff, your, your turn. One bold prediction for 2022. Um, I, I think it's going to be from a, from a leasing perspective and, and store growth perspective uh, relative to closings. I think it's going to be maybe the best year we've ever seen. Um, I echo what Carly says. Uh, you've got people who have finally, they took the time during the pandemic to figure out what they want to be and how they want to proceed. Uh, and they have, they have plans, they have strategies, they know what they're doing. Whereas it was previously, well, I just need to grow by X stores a year. Now it's strategic. They've really thought it through of who do I want to be and where do I want to be? I think we're going to see record new store openings. It's going to look different. It may not be, you know, square footage for square footage as, as prototypes get a little tighter. Uh, I think you're going to see a huge, huge resurgence in uh, neighborhood retail the store that I can walk to down the street, as opposed to getting in my car and driving to, you know, the local mall. So I think you're going to see more stores uh, on streets, which is ultimately going to increase store count. Again, convenience is going to be the, the key, but these brands, I think you're going to see record expansion. So it's, it's so interesting. It's a great point. And it's, it harkens back to what Carly was saying. And we hear this from, you know, a lot of the folks we speak to on the retail side of how do we, how do we start thinking differently about each store. So Target's kind of part of the genius is the store in one area looks nothing like a store nearby because it's built to, to cater to a specific audience. Because more retailers embrace that concept, they're going to see a lot of, of local success. Uh, great question came in. What experiential retail technology are you most excited for heading into 2022? Jeff, you could start with this one. Um, you know, the the Virtual try-on and the uh, is probably what I'm most interested in. It, it gives you the ability to engage a little bit, um, whether it's at home before you, like Warby Parker, you can go online and uh, hold up your screen and it'll show you what the glasses look like. The, the ability to do some pre-education as well as to quickly cycle through some of these things, I think that's going to be really interesting. The virtual dressing room, um, we'll see how that ultimately goes. That's probably what I'm most interested in and, and excited to see how it integrates in. Uh, cashless has been, I don't know, it, it's great. I, I like it. It is, I, I get a little tired every now and then of looking at the credit card bills and it's, you know, $1.50, $1.50, $1.50, but uh, everybody's going that direction anyway. So I think that's here to stay, but I, I think it's the virtual aspect of retail. Carly. I agree. I like the smart mirrors in particular, where you would have an outfit on and it would suggest other pieces. I think that will be a great way for retailers to increase their overall ticket value, their checkout costs, um, or overall spend, I guess. So, you, you know, you have one piece on, well, these four other things might look good here. Let us show you. Uh, so I think that's really, really interesting. Also, just the, the computer vision, understanding how the consumer shops and making the experience more enjoyable. You know, where are they spending most time? Where do their eyes go? It's, it's crazy stuff. But I think it's, it's going to, when we don't think about that we're being tracked that much, I think it's going to lead to a more enjoyable shopping experience for the consumer uh, when all that's happening behind the scenes. Agreed. I think, I think it's a, there's a lot of really cool things happening. You mentioned the computer vision. Anytime you can get cameras in the store, there's so much more you can do with them now. Um, uh, question came in, any commentary on jewelry? Amazing momentum in 2021, will this carry to 22 or has this segment hit a limit? Feel free to jump in either if you have a, if you have a strong opinion uh, on jewelry. Well, it, it, it's, it's all over the board. I mean, high-end jewelry, the whole luxury category, we could do a whole nother hour on <laughs> what the heck happened there. Um, I, that's one of the things I would not have said was gonna explode the way it did during the pandemic, but um, I think the more moderate price, you look at Goriana, Missouri, Kendra Scott, those types of, of jewelry experiences, I, they're doing as well as they, they're doing best numbers they've ever seen. So um, I think that's here to stay. I think people are, are trying to accessorize, yet there's a little bit of this dress down. I don't necessarily need a lot of very expensive stuff. I want stuff that if I don't like it, I don't feel bad about not wearing it. Um, on the luxury side, I don't know. There's, it feels like at some point that's got to slow down, but it certainly hasn't shown any signs. So I have no idea what's going to happen there. I will say from a data 
standpoint, it's not a category that I track because they're not single tenant. They're not often in my wheelhouse from investment sales, but I do think that there's room for a mid-level winner to yeah. emerge. We, we just, we don't have anybody, right? Luxury, we know the brand, right? They're, they're doing great, amazingly, like you said, Jeff. But where do you go when you're, you're going back to the office and you're like, oh, I wanna look polished and together. I don't know, it, it's difficult to find that mid-level, you know, not buying stuff on Amazon for $10 for 10 pairs of earrings, right? Not Tiffany's all day, where is quality mid-level jewelry? So I think we see demand, we just don't have a great answer yet. It's interesting to see that because I was speaking with the founder of uh, Goriana yesterday and they were typically not, not low end, but lower price point, but they've added a fine jewelry section and have found mm -hmm. that that has really sold very, very well, that you need to have a, a more moderate price point, middle price point and upper price point. You need to be able to layer whatever jewelry you're going to get, layer it through those price points. But that middle winner is just not a real clear, clear person yet. Uh, I, we'll go one more. Uh, you know, someone did ask how much of the increased spend is inflation. Some, you know, it's, it feels like a 50-50 mm -hmm. split. I think it depends on the sector, but you're right. It is a mix of factors, and especially depending on when in the year it happened. Later in the year, obviously had a more significant impact. But uh, Jim had a question. What online retailer will be the next to move from online to brick and mortar? Carly, you want to start there? Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to think of any that haven't already, actually. <laughs> I feel like we've talked about everybody. Uh, now that I have a good answer, let me think on that for a minute. Jeff, can you think of any that haven't I can't, I can't dipped think their of toe in yet? I can't think of one specifically that I could say, okay, that's the next guy. Right. Um, there are a lot. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I have one. I okay. have one. Sh uh, shine, Shein, S-H-E-I-N. Yeah, Shine. My kids love it. Shine, right? I always say Shine. Yeah. I knew that was wrong. Okay. I could <laughs> well, see I could, them. I could <laughs> well, it's somewhere between those two. <laughs> so, right. Somewhere in between there. We all know what we're talking about. Oh, Shein. Thank you from the, you the audience. Um, I could see them opening bricks and mortar stores, and I haven't seen it. I, I think they would be a competitor to H&M, but an even lower price point. Extreme fast fashion. Uh, my kids love it. I hate it. Uh, I don't know. I could see them. Oh, pop-ups. Nice. Good. Thanks, audience. I, I could see them jumping in and being successful. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the reality is they're, they're all coming offline. They're coming offline either with owned retail. They're coming offline in, in pop-ups. They're kind of come offline through neighborhood goods. I mean, they're all, they're all coming. Like it's, it's the, the, it was the CEO of Everlane. It was in late 2018 or late 2019. So the worst kept secret of online only is that it's not profitable at scale. So if these companies right. want to scale, they need to have locations. It, it, it's not just for sales, it's for many other reasons, but it's, it's a big piece of the puzzle. And with that, I want to thank Jeff and Carly so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure having you. This was, we're over time already and it was, it felt like it really ran by. So thank you both so much for being here. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, hopefully we'll get to see you many more times throughout this year. Wishing you all you know, a happy new year, a successful new year, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Jeff, Carly, thanks again. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ethan.